Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Your host today is Richard Fields. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show today we have John Cameron and Carla Howell. Welcome to the show, Carla. Uh, there have been a lot of mass shootings. Uh, well, they, they kind of come in come in, in bunches. And uh, the latest bunch, uh, I'm in Orange County now, and there was a, a mass shooting, I, I guess four people count as a mass shooting these days, uh, of, uh, you know, it looked like a beef between somebody uh, and uh, an ex-wife's boss or something like that. Another one took place in in Atlanta not too long ago, which appeared to be some uh, religious guy thinking that he was being too tempted by as far as parlor workers. And then there was another one. Uh, they just they just seemed to, to come and go and uh, almost numb the mind. Mass shootings, how can they prevent it? Carla Hall. Well, the way to stop mass shootings or minimize them is to make sure that the good guys are armed and make it difficult for the bad guys. And the problem that we have with mass shootings, according to John Lott's book, Gun Control Myths, something like 94, mid 90 percentage of mass shootings occur where guns are banned. I guess bans aren't working, aren't they? Are they? You know, if, if almost all of the mass shootings happen, gun people who want to commit a mass shooting go where they can get away with it, where there's not going to be anyone to take them down. And that's the fundamental problem. We need to repeal things. We need to repeal a law like the Gun Free School Zones Act because the, the schools are the first place you want to protect. And you're basically putting them a big neon sign outside the school saying, come on in mass shooters. There's no one's going to, you'll be able to do a great deal of harm with national news with no one to take you down. You uh, did not start out as a uh, Second Amendment uh, aficionado, right, Carla? You, you came to the your position gradually. How did that happen? Um, well, I, uh, I met a bunch of libertarians. I got involved in the libertarian movement because of health care. That was the, my passion that got me involved, and I met libertarians. And eventually, actually, I went to a, a gun show to um, petition for a libertarian candidate, um, and I was shocked to see guns in cases. I'd never been to a gun store or a gun show or anything and got talking to a bunch of the dealers there and was shocked at how responsible and conscientious and knowledgeable they were. They were nothing like what I had imagined gun owners were and <clears throat> met a lot of gun owners when I got into campaigning. Then I started to meet people like I talk about in, in the song that you're going to be playing, as I understand, on this show. Um, who showed me their personal needs for why they carry a gun. And, and they were really nice people and responsible people and couples and women. And it's like, this isn't what I thought gun owner, owner, owners were. You know, I thought they were rednecks, guys, you know, shooting up cans in the backyard, yeah. they drink some beers and good old boys. And I didn't think anyone I knew would ever have a gun. And <laughs> that's how ignorant I was. I just, I just came from a world where there just guns didn't exist in my world, almost not at all. And uh, Well, and, and, and the title of your song is what, Good People, right? Good Folks. Good Folks. Let's, yeah. let's play the song. Okay. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. <laughs> we're not going to allow it. Well, I never liked those guns, and I wondered who would own a gun. I figured they were not folks like me. Those who claim a need were living far away from me. I wrote them off as rednecks and thieves. I introduced the first assault weapons ban. I got it passed. And my neighbor Sue and Ted said they keep one by their bed. What a surprise that was to me. Sue and Ted are decent folk. Taught me things I didn't know. I guess I didn't understand them. Single 
mom who said she couldn't wait that long A stalker scared her out of her mind She said she had to get a gun to protect her baby son No cop would be on hand before the I support them. I won't chip away at them. Susanna, her mom and dad were dining when a man gone mad came shooting customers before her eyes. Susanna could have saved that crowd, but carrying guns was not allowed. That madman took both her parents' lives. I've a new respect for guns and I'd never want to stop someone from being safe and free Those who feel a need are living all around me They're men and women guarding families Taking guns away no, no. Leaves good folks in harm's way We shall not the aggressors here. We are here coming in peace. Support and defend the Second Amendment and keep up the fight. Impressive video, Carla, if I do say so myself. Uh, how did you come up with the, the idea for turning your message into a song? Um, well, I set out to write a bunch of libertarian songs at, at one point and finally got around to recording them um, recently. And my goal was to talk about issues that were being talked about and especially that hadn't been covered in song. And so guns was an issue that I ran on when I ran for U.S. Senate in 2000 against Ted Kennedy. Um, and also in 2002 when I ran for governor against Mitt Romney, both of whom I consider anti-gun, if not massively anti-gun. And um, it's, it's an issue that's grossly misunderstood and decided it was one that needed a song. What other songs are uh, in your uh, repertoire? What other issues have you uh, written about? Um, that I've released two songs so far that are at my website, carlahowell.com. One is about the war on drugs, and it draws parallels between the alcohol prohibition and the drug prohibition. Um, another song that is released is called First Do No Harm, and it basically says before we pass laws, we need to look at whether they're going to harm people, just like the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take. Our goal should be in po making policy not to harm anyone. I mean, policy is supposed to be good for people, right? It's supposed to make things better. But we know that, in fact, many laws make things worse. So <clears throat> that encourages people to think about all the things we need to think about, all the far-reaching, unintended or maybe intended consequences of laws and do something about it, you know, stop that law from passing in the first place. And of course, we need to repeal a lot that are on the books. But um, that's what that song's about. I've, I've written a song on education, on taxes, on generally making government small, one related to licensing, um, one that's sort of a libertarian anthem called Rise Forever Liberty. So these will be coming out over the next year or so. A couple of them already are out at my website. So, And now I'm working on videos for those songs. And I find the videos to be you know, significantly more compelling than just listening to audio. So, and I really want people to share this music with friends. A lot of them like this song, Good Folks, were intended for people to show to their friends. Not the people who are 
very adamantly against any kind of gun freedom because they're just they've made up their minds they're not gonna they're not gonna move much but there's a lot of people who who are like I was I was more anti-gun than pro-gun but it, it wasn't a big issue for me it wasn't the biggest issue and I think there's a lot of people for whom that's true uh, it's a very big issue for gun owners and those of us who really care about this important right of self-defense um, but there's a lot of people for whom it's it's not a voting issue but we need them to understand we need to get them to understand this doesn't help these laws make things worse they make they increase the chances of your child in school being killed by some lunatic who who comes in with guns um, it doesn't make them safer it doesn't make us safer anywhere and <clears throat> if you really care about violence and people dying unnecessary deaths the mass shootings is just the tip of the iceberg it's what gets all the attention because it's dramatic but you know less than a hundred people or so die a year in mass shootings but thousands of people die in homicides every year and a lot of people die in suicides some people die in justifiable homicides and there's different categories that are often overlooked but um, if you really care about stopping unnecessary violence the important thing is to make sure the good guys the good folks are armed and that's how we minimize crime not to mention the fact that uh not hundreds or thousands but hundreds of millions or upwards of 100 million people in the 20th century died at the hands of governments i'm talking uh, everybody from hitler to stalin to uh mao to uh, pol pot uh governments are the biggest killers of people of all and why in the world would anybody who is against gun violence give governments a monopoly on guns not not doesn't compute for me doesn't compute for me either or or libertarians or gun owners but i think the average person isn't going to understand that at least not initially they're going to understand a woman who can't take defend her children from and herself from a stalker they're going to understand, um, you know, home invasions. They, they don't really have a, a good uh, grasp of the threat of government. But, of course, we do need to have that protection against government and overrun, you know, a, a government that overruns the population. And you, you and I know that Hitler and all these other tyrants throughout history, one of their first strategies was to take the guns away from citizens and that allowed them to create a tyranny and, and control people and that's a real threat. But it's not what this song is about because I think most people just, they need to kind of first understand self-defense before they're going to understand that. Baby steps, yeah. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the uh, other examples of government uh, operating in a, in a, a, a tyrannical way in, 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 a, in a context in which people can understand it is the whole issue of kids in cages at the Mexican border in the United States. It was a rallying cry for the anti-Trump uh, campaign uh, for the Democrats, kids in cages, kids in cages, just repeated over and over and over again with videos. Now we're seeing the same kinds of videos, kids in cages. Mm -hmm. Same boss or old boss, same as the new boss? Yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> new boss, same as the old boss. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, we got a situation down there, um, and I think the the first thing to talk about with respect to the border crisis is is the war on drugs, because why would anyone seek asylum from a Central American country? Almost always, it's going to be drug gang related, and the cartels, and the the murder rate in Mexico is one of the highest in the world. Uh, you know, the, there's mayhem going on down there, and a lot of it is because of the American war on drugs. Uh, you know, they're they're on the verge of hopefully legalizing or semi-legalizing marijuana in Mexico, and that will be a good start. <clears throat> they tried to do it 10 or 15 years ago, and I can't prove it, but I would bet anything that the federal government and its assigns stopped that from happening. They did not want Mexico legalizing drugs they it would undermine all their rationale for keeping the war going here in this country mm -hmm. and uh, so i think the first step in any kind of immigration policy is end this absolutely ridiculous and failed war on drugs hasn't worked makes things worse it encourages bad drug it discourages responsible drug users and encourages addiction and fentanyl and all the worst aspects of drug use
So the, so the war needs to end. Let's, let's end that and then let's get a comprehensive immigration policy passed that <clears throat> people can live with that recognizes the need for workers in this country, both their need for, my, for a job and our, our employer's need for, for workers. And if we think we can somehow <clears throat> protect American jobs by keeping them out, we're just going to keep losing in the world in worldwide trade. You know, if you think if you're a, a fiscal conservative or libertarian and realizes that trade barriers are bad, well, so is keeping out cheap labor because we have to be able to keep, compete internationally. And both these things just hurt us and send more business overseas. So, so we need a rational immigration policy. But mostly, let's start with ending the war on drugs because asylum Do is they- to go to all the time on this issue. Certainly the war on drugs is the push factor when it comes to uh, immigration from Central uh, Central America to the United States. But also uh, there's a pull factor and the pull factor is more jobs at a higher pay in the United States as well as more welfare in the United States than in uh, Guatemala or Honduras or Mexico. So there's a, there's a pull factor as well as a push factor. And I've always said that it's, it's real easy to end the, the immigration problem, extremely easy. Easy to say, not easy to do. Step one, end welfare in the United States for native born as well as immigrants. Step two, open immigration. The pull factor goes away and the push factor goes away. Yeah. And, and then the war on drugs. Yeah, much, much easier said than done. The, the, the thing that bothers me, you, you talked about unintended consequences and, and uh, on, on one of the, the other shows, I talked with a gentleman that, that is in agreement with me. So there's at least one other. And that's the, the fact that I think the unintended consequences actually, if you do something for 50 years and the unintended consequences are, are brutal and you still keep doing it, there can only be two uh, rationales for that. Either one, you're you're uh, insane or stupid, in which case you shouldn't be in a position where you can create this policy. Or two, which is more likely to me, is the unintended consequence is actually the consequence that that some subset of the people that are writing your paycheck actually want to happen. And if you look at at the the huge, you know, you talk the infrastructure deal that uh, isn't really infrastructure. If you look at at all the huge stakeholders who benefit. Uh, in this country by the war on drugs. You look at uh, uh, the DAs, the police departments, the prison guards, uh, the people who work in, you know, drug rehab and, and all the rest of that stuff, the, uh, the DEA, all the rest of that. The vested interest of these people in keeping, you know, their the drugs illegal and keeping the jobs is huge. And so... Um, you know that that's the biggest and if you if you can get a chief of police somewhere drunk enough they'll tell you the reason they don't want legalized drugs is because they'd be cutting payroll in their departments left and right because if you pull drug crime out of it or what we call drug crime and and all the offshoots of drug crime crime would virtually go away you know then all they they'd be able to do is arrest people for selling single cigarettes and that's something that a libertarian would get rid of as well so it's my feeling that these these unintended consequences are actually um, the intended consequence it's just nobody talks about it i think that's right i think that's why they stopped the the mexicans from repealing the, the marijuana war back 15 years ago or so and i believe it was in your state in california wasn't it prison wardens to organize to stop an initiative, I, th- I believe it was a ballot initiative, but it might have been legislation to decriminalize or push back on the war on drugs. And the, the main opposition was a prison warden union. And oh, that's yeah, that, kind of say well, it yeah, all. Correctional officers. Yeah. Yeah, correctional correctional officers. Officers. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the military industrial, uh, the, the, the prison industrial complex is a big thing and drives a whole lot of legislation when it comes to uh, keeping the drug war in place as much as possible. No question about it. You made a, a, a transition toward the, to the next topic, which is the, the so-called infrastructure bill. One more uh, replay of uh, new boss, same as the old boss. We had a huge uh, increase in spending under the Trump administration, supposedly uh, to uh, uh, fight COVID and, and so forth. 
Now we're, we see we saw exactly the same thing uh, under Biden, uh, fighting COVID with a huge uh, $1.9 trillion bill. Now he wants to follow that with a $3 trillion bill, which also uh, would be very little about infrastructure. It's more about uh, uh, EVs for the, uh, for the more, more money for EVs than for roads and bridges, more money for home health care, which is another form of welfare, uh, more funding for research and development, which is corporate welfare, in effect. Uh, in fact, this is the biggest wish list of the Democrats since the New Deal or the Great Society. It would be uh, multitudes more expensive once uh, fully implemented. And Biden's trying to get it implemented in his first two years. It's frightening. <clears throat> it's positively frightening. And I think, you know, I have some sympathy for Trump for the way he was treated during his presidency, but he kind of uh, blew any claim to being small government fiscal conservative in any way, shape or form in the last year of his presidency when he signed off not only on what, three, four trillion dollars in spending, but also was pushing for another two, three, two, three billion towards the end of his presidency, apparently just to get votes. And I mean, that that's just beyond shameful. That's unbelievable. So let's not forget that many of these Republicans who are now voting uh, and opposing this bill, and I hope they can string together enough people to stop it, uh, even with reconciliation, if they go that route. Let's not forget that the majority of them were voting happily for trillions of dollars in spending last year, including Trump. And that that is just unforgivable. I mean, it, it's it's hard to imagine the price we're going to have to pay for these bills, which obviously we're not going to actually be paying back in the foreseeable future. But the, the fact that they're going to have to keep interest rates low, which perverts the stock market, perverts people's investment incentives, perverts the markets right and left. It's going to keep inflation is on the rise. It could get much worse. We could see uh, uh, a housing bubble or some kind of other bubble with just the instability caused by printing trillions of dollars. Um, this is this is really, really treacherous. Unfortunately, it is, it's hard to convince people of that, but it, it really is scary. And I, I'm very concerned about it, as I know you are. I have a, a good friend who manufactures manifolds and mufflers for a snowmobile company uh, here in California. And uh, talking to him recently, he told me that the, the price of, uh, I think it's, I forget, some trace element mineral that's used in, in, uh, in uh, uh, manifolds, as well as steel, as well as his other uh, input products, has been skyrocketing. It's been going up like crazy. So we're seeing the cost of producer goods rise already. We're seeing the cost of food start to skyrocket, and food is a bigger inflation indicator, uh, of, a bigger indicator of future inflation than is the uh, the, uh, the the consumer price index or the uh, PPI that the Fed likes to use to uh, target inflation. And so inflation is coming and inflation is the way that we'll be paying for most of the uh, ridiculous spending that's being implemented by the Biden administration as we speak. Uh, we're worried about Biden putting into place higher taxes and he probably will or he'll at least try to. But the real cost is going to be in the cost of uh, food, the cost of clothing, the cost of everything that people need in order to live a comfortable life. And it will be orders of magnitude more than the so-called 2% inflation that the Fed is supposedly targeting. The Fed has already said that we're, we're targeting more than 2% in order to get an average of 2%. What people don't realize is that 2% inflation means your money loses half its value in a lifetime, in, a, in, a, in 35 years, which is, you know, one generation. Uh, you know, uh, in a few generations, your money is worth 93% less than, or 95% less than it started out being worth which is kind of what's happened since 1971 when we went off the gold standard. So, you know, we've got, a, we've got a problem when it comes to paying for all of the promises that the Democrats are using to stay in office. I saw a recent uh, survey that said from, I think it was, it was publicized in the Washington Post of all places, and it said that Congress is now more popular than it's ever been in recent history, which brings yeah. to mind, which brings to mind the, uh, the Tocqueville quote that uh, the, uh, the democracy or a republic can last only as long as people don't uh, people don't figure out that they can vote themselves benefits from the public purse. Well, I think uh, that you know I want to look at that number, and I was going to try to pull it up quickly on my phone. I realized I couldn't do it quickly enough to 
stay in this segment that, uh, you know, Congress being more popular than it's ever been, I, I question that because at, at one time Congress was actually you know, pretty popular and trusted, but uh, more popular than it's been in a while could still mean that they're, that people's trust in, in them as, a, as an honest institution uh, would, could be below 20% and still way above what it's been. So, um, you know, that I think that, uh, you know, Biden is, is uh, you know, Biden is pushing all these crazy things because the, the, uh, the midterms, uh, I believe, and I think Richard's going to argue against this, that, that you know, that uh, the mid, midterms would be a, a bloodbath for the Socialist Party in this country that's self-labeled as Democrats. Uh, Richard, I think, disagrees with that. But um, I don't think, you know, uh, the, the Democratic um, kind of punchline that they're talking about is that, that, that Obama didn't push hard enough, you know, when he, when he pushed through, uh, you know, health care, Obamacare, whatever you call it, and he, and he should have, when he had that, the, the, the reins in his hands, he should have gone ahead and done it more quickly. And um, I, I don't think that, that Biden's going to get more than a couple of years to, to do this kind of stuff before some different folks are in the House and the Senate. That will yeah, we can argue about that, but we only have a minute left, John. Yeah. So I'm not going to I'm not going to argue about it because I do disagree. But I am going to ask Carla. Uh, you're yeah. close to the uh, heartbeat of what the Libertarian Party is doing uh, over the next few years. What do you think the Libertarian response, the Libertarian Big Al Libertarian Party response, should be to the uh, craziness that we're seeing uh, in the uh, body politic? Well, I think that a point that we need to stress, it's not just the financial, the dollar, the monetary implications of all this crazy multi-trillion dollars of spending. It's what they're spending it on because there's, we know that most of what government does makes things worse and you give them trillions upon trillions of dollars to do more bad things, to make the schools worse, to entrench the teachers unions more, to make healthcare worse, to undermine free markets, to undermine wealth in myriad ways. Uh, that's the real problem. Um, a friend, a good friend of mine who, with whom I uh, ran many campaigns, Michael Cloud, has a concept called the bonfire test, that if government spending is so bad that you're better off putting that money in a bonfire and letting it just go up in smoke, that's a real sign you need to get rid of that program. And that's what most of these trillions of dollars are, are funding. Is really and that's, a, that's a good way to end the show. We're out of time. Thank you very much, Carla Howell. Thank you very much, John Cameron, for being part of the Libertarian Counterpoint. See you again next week, same time, same place, and on YouTube and elsewhere. Thank you very much. This is Gail Morgan with Libertarian Counterpoint Productions. Knuckleheads of Liberty, Monday nights at 5.30 on Channel 17. Libertarian Counterpoint on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. on Channel 17. Also, you may catch our shows on YouTube, Facebook, and on other social media. Once again, thank you for watching Libertarian Counterpoint Productions.